Now, some may hear all of this talk of conflict and opposition and said choppery and pissery and start to find themselves getting a little uncomfortable, perhaps even irritated, maybe even provoked. They may be tempted to say something along the lines of, you're not being very winsome, or you're going to hurt your witness. In response to them, I would simply quote the words of C.S. Lewis and say, don't talk damned nonsense. Welcome to the Godly Troublemaker Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Parker. The Godly Troublemaker exists to shine the light of Christ in the eyes of the idols of our day. Let's go get into some trouble. Introduction. My name is Andy and welcome to my podcast. So here I am, throwing my hat in the ring, or perhaps if you will, seeking to sift out the 300 to storm the Midianite camp to slaughter them. But there I go already using triggering words. Perhaps it would be apropos in our progressive day and age, perhaps even more winsome, to say that we're going to travel merrily down the yellow brick road together with our junk neatly tucked in our brand new one-piece swimsuits all the way to the wizard's house. So here we go. We're off to see the wizard. Why? Because, 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 because of the wonderful things he does. As we sing and dance our way down this yellow stained road, making our way to the Emerald City, we can't help but joyfully share stories of the wonderful wizard and the wonderful things he does. We share tales of how the wizard has wonderfully cared for our children by educating them so that we could all live our best lives now. Tales of how he protects us and provides for us in retirement. Tales of how he recently saved us from the most deadly virus ever in human history. Tales of how he controls the climate and spreads good tidings of great joy through diversity, inclusion, and hormone blockers. Tales of how this wizard can even control reality, which is good because it's such a moving target these days. So as we arrive at Babel, I mean the Emerald City, the first thing we notice besides the flying monkeys and the stench filling the air, is that the luster is gone. As we reach the end of our tether, I mean the road, we see that the Emerald City looks more like an empire of dirt. And though we don't want to discriminate against the geographically unsettled's ability to defecate in public, we can't help but notice it all over our shoes. But here we are. We've traveled all this way. We might as well beseech the wizard for his divine counsel. But as we're given an audience with the great and powerful Oz, we made the mistake of peering behind the curtain and notice an angry, short, chubby, purpled-haired lesbian named Becky. It's a reboot, after all. And all this brings us back to the beginning, or the ring, or the arena, with all of its triggering language of battles and warfare and mud and blood and sweat and bones. And I haven't even used the word patriarchy yet. This brings us to the very heart of the godly troublemaker. We not only want to give instruction in sound doctrine, but also to rebuke those who contradict it. Titus 1.9 We want to exalt Christ in every sphere of life and demolish strongholds in every lofty opinion that stands opposed to him. 2 Corinthians 10.5 Which means we're guaranteed to piss off snowflakes and Big Eva on a weekly basis. But I repeat myself. In our culture, which has absolutely no problem exposing itself, we want to go one step further and remove the curtain completely, exposing all of the Beckys of our day. But there I go, already talking about feminism and public education. And our desire is not to simply expose the idols of our day, but to chop them down. As a dear brother in Christ recently said regarding Thor's oak, chop, chop. Given that there are many men already engaged in said choppery and pissery, is it really necessary to have one more voice in the space? Obviously, my answer is yes. The secularists have been planting oaks for decades, and if I can play my part in chopping some of them down, count me in. By the grace of God, we will chop them all down and have one great big refining fire warming ourselves on the ash heap of paganism and secularism. Now, some may hear all of this talk of conflict and opposition and said choppery and pissery and start to find themselves getting a little uncomfortable, perhaps even irritated, maybe even provoked. 
they may be tempted to say something along the lines of, you're not being very winsome, or you're going to hurt your witness. In response to them, I would simply quote the words of C.S. Lewis and say, don't talk damned nonsense. The Godly Troublemaker I am fully aware that using a term like godly troublemaker or troublemaking is enough to get the yoga pants to rise all the way up in Evan Jellyfish's LGBTQ2 plus hole. One may protest, that doesn't sound very winsome, or you're just trying to be a provocateur using such provocative language to provoke people to provocation. And isn't this in direct violation of the 11th commandment with an an incendiary conclusion? And all of this coming from a pastor. What this has to do with the 11th commandment, I know not what. However, Regarding the evangelical women of both sexes that would protest to said godly troublemaking and troublemakers, I would like to point out clearly, emphatically, unapologetically, and once for all from this day forth and forevermore, that their problem is not with the word troublemaker, but with the word godly. These evangelifish are like an embarrassingly large turd that has breached the surface for far too long, and now the stink is filling the entirety of our country and most churches. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. James 4.4 In the name of winsomeness, which, just FYI, is an unbiblical category made up by cowards who need a justification for their complacency. They've stretched the back door wide open, yes, pun intended, to feminism, statism, and every form of sexual depravity. How dare I comment on such things? I'm not even a biologist or a proctologist. Their desperate, incessant desire to be liked by the cool kids has caused most to compromise, if not outright abandon, the sharp two-edged sword of God's word, exchanging it for a nice nerf sword that the world likes better. Like an unruly, stiff-necked woman who tells her husband he is a good leader when he leads the way that she wants him to, evangelicals have allowed the world to tell them what is and what is not winsome. The tragic irony is, after removing pillar and buttress, they can't figure out why the culture that they've helped create is crumbling around them. Instead of repentance, they would rather gaze upon the emperor's beautiful new attire, regardless of whether or not his junk is eye-level with our kids. But there I go talking about Disney and government schools again. And how dare you point that out, you may say. You're never going to win the emperor that way, you bigoted racist, while being racistly bigoted. So then, the evangelical world has no problem whatsoever with trouble or troublemaking, as long as it's the popular kind that hates God. But when it comes to the kind in the Bible, you know, the godly kind, you know, the kind that actually loves God's law word, they freak out. Weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth and the like, all the while declaring that not all Christians think like he does, and that there are obviously much nicer ones who don't believe the Bible and Jesus and all of that other stuff. All of this to say, the problem isn't only with Thor's oak. The problem is that Thor's oak is growing right up through the poop chute of evangelicalism and straight out the top of a renovated mini ball with a neon sign out front with an edgy name like Ignite. So yeah, I intend to create a whole heap of trouble. Lots of it. A whole lot of it. You know, the kind of trouble that wasn't trouble two years ago. The kind of trouble that says boys have a penis and girls have a vagina. And if that sounds radical, it's probably because you have a vagina behaving like a penis. Now, there may be some that will cry foul and cry like Becky the day after the 2016 election. But again, I would remind you that they have no problem with penis and vagina talk. They just have a problem with it in the right order and in the right context, like in the Bible and not in the government schools and in the first grade. But hey, you keep going to your school board meetings. I'm sure it will end well for you. So yeah, trouble is what we seek, and contramundum is our cry. But it must be clearly stated that we don't desire trouble for trouble's sake, nor are we creating trouble at all. We are simply exposing the trouble that already exists, trouble with the Lord and with his anointed. 
Wherever the gospel of Jesus Christ is faithfully preached and the servant of Jesus faithfully declares that it all belongs to Jesus, that he is Lord and that no one and nothing else is, you are going to have trouble. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace, but in the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. Our troublemaking is a godly troublemaking, the kind that believes the promise of God and names his wife Eve, the kind of trouble that takes a hundred years to build an ark in the middle of dry land, the kind of trouble that believes God and it's credited to him as righteousness, the kind of trouble that flees from Egypt and conquers Canaan and slaughters the Canaanites, the kind of trouble that kills a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ass and a bad attitude, the kind of trouble that stands before giants and taunts them and then cuts off their heads, the kind of trouble that builds up kingdoms and the kind of trouble that refuses to bow down to their idols. That kind of trouble that repents of sin and confesses Jesus as Lord of all. The kind of trouble that thinks generationally and has an optimistic eschatology. The kind of trouble that offers the nations the terms of surrender, repent, and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. The kind of trouble that says, bring on your best. The advance of the gospel cannot be stopped. The more the world rages, the more we advance. The more they kill, the more we multiply. So courage, dear heart, the future is Christian. This kind of troublemaking is not of the scorched earth variety, but is of the variety of the refiner's fire. This kind of troublemaking not only tears down, it also plants, it cultivates, and builds. We're not merely engaged in deforestation. We are planting oaks of our own that will last to a thousand generations, and the soil these oaks are growing in is covenant renewal worship. Conclusion. Jesus promised his disciples three things, that they would be completely fearless, absurdly happy, and in constant trouble. G.K. Chesterton. We plan on putting forth a varsity-level effort in receiving the promises of God. That is to be completely fearless, absurdly happy, and in constant trouble. And if my little foray into podcasting and blogging and vlogging doesn't work, I can always fall back on a side hustle of sharing pictures of my butt on Instagram. I hear that's profitable these days, and who knows? Maybe I'll win some evangelicals along the way. Before you go, if you like this video and want to see more, subscribe to our channel and like this video and leave a comment. Also, go follow us on social media to stay posted on all of our new content, updates, and lots more.